Well, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. So I just wanted to quickly kind of finish up uh, chapter one, take a look at just a couple of questions. We went through most of the material in chapter one. It's supposed to go there now, so keep those. We went through uh, all the material in chapter one, um, but I just had a couple of uh, questions I wanted to ask for kind of discussion before we move into um, chapter two, because there's a couple of tiny little things that we didn't get to, um, but that shouldn't take very long this evening. So if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter one, we will get into just a few uh, small pieces there in just a moment. But before we do that, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our most righteous Father, we praise your name this evening. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to study a portion of your word. We pray, Lord, that what we learn, we can apply in our lives and that we can be more like your son, Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you'll give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom to do that. We pray, Lord, that uh, what we do here this evening will be pleasing in your sight and that we can be uplifted and encourage one another in, in order to serve you better. Lord, we ask that you be with those who are sick and in need of your healing hand. There are so many in our hearts and our minds, and we pray that you will be with them and be with the doctors attending to them as well. And Lord, we are most thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice, and we ask all these things through his holy and blessed name. Amen. All right, so I wanted to just revisit these two stories here where Jesus calls his uh, first disciples. Well, really, he doesn't and that's one of the points that I kind of wanted to talk about was the, the uh, Andrew and Peter story. So if we want to just quickly pick up in uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 40. Chapter 1 and verse 40, where it says, And one of the two who had heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, So, you are Simon, the son of John? You shall be called called Cephas, which means Peter, which, of course, we know is uh, the Greek and Aramaic words for rock, right? That's basically what he's he's, he's naming him here. It's similar to that, but it's pretty much uh, calling him um, the rock here. So, but we really don't see Peter's name show up again until chapter 6. So here we are in chapter 1, and we don't see Peter's name show up in the Gospel of John until chapter 6, which which we're going to talk about a little later this evening, is the next Passover. So it's a whole, it's almost, it's over a year since this incident to where we see Peter's name again in chapter 6. So I don't think, obviously, that Jesus waited a whole year before he went and uh, called Peter, Clearly, Peter was called at some point during this time, and I think there's actual, <clears throat> there is a time in here which seems plausible that uh, Peter uh, followed Jesus, and we'll talk about a little bit of that tonight, to just kind of fit some of that timeline together. Um, but it does seem, at least at this point, right, because we all know how Peter was called, right? It's a very famous story. It's in, yeah, all three of the other Gospels, if I recall. I know two of them. I'm trying to remember if it's in Luke. I believe it is. Uh, When he's by the sea, oh, we didn't catch anything. Cast your nets again. He catches all the fish. And Jesus says, follow me, right? That's the story. But this isn't that story, right? This is where he first meets Jesus. So clearly this happens after he first meets Jesus. Or his actual calling happens after this, right? So... What do, you, what do you think that Peter was actually thinking after he meets Jesus? Because the story almost abruptly ends there in um, verse 42. What do you think happens? And what do you think Peter was thinking? One thing that, that came to my mind, uh, when Andrew introduced Peter to Christ, he, well, before he, he said, we have found him. Mm-hmm. He didn't say this might be the Messiah. Right. Sure right. Oh, for sure. For sure. I think it's clear that that's one thing that he was really thinking about. 
Andrew's experience, which is much different than Peter, right? Remember, Andrew saw John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. And, right? He saw that. And he's heard John's preaching. And then he followed Jesus. And he heard Jesus preaching. Right? Andrew was certain. And you're absolutely right. That's a really good point about what he says to, to Peter. He doesn't say, you know, it's possible we might have found him. No, he says, no, we've, this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. And you need to come see him. Peter, of course, hasn't experienced all that Andrew has. And I think as we, some of the things that we know about Peter, uh, he seems a bit more um, reluctant about some things. He's very, um, he's very quick to make a decision or to do things. Um, but he also, I think part of that personality too is almost a skepticism as well. And so it's possible that Peter was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll come see and... And at first he's kind of taken aback by what Jesus says to him, and maybe he listens to Jesus, but he doesn't follow him at this point. Anything else that we think that Jesus or that Peter might be thinking or doing? <laughs> yeah, that's really possible too. We're like, oh, okay, that's okay. All right, I guess I have a new name now, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, uh, and you know it's it was definitely a exciting time I think for the Jewish nation when they were all looking for the Messiah and trying to find who this might be, um, and then the confidence of Andrew I think though shows not only the power of John's preaching, but the power of Jesus' preaching as well. Because there were a lot of people who claimed to be the Messiah. Um, and I don't think Andrew would have fallen for that. But he, when he heard Jesus speak, he knew this is the Messiah. This is who we need to follow. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, I think it's clear that uh, he is obviously drawn to Jesus. Um, but it is just, it's hard to know, like, what happens between now and then when we find him again in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he's fishing, right? But um, if you recall, Peter, of course, is married, right? Because he heals his mother-in-law, so he obviously has a wife. Um, we don't know if he has any kids, but he clearly has some sort of family to support, right? And he probably comes, meets Jesus and says, wow, that's amazing. That's wonderful. But you know what? I've got responsibilities. I've got duties and I need to go take care of, care of this, right? Um, and so that's why I think we find him again. And I, but I don't think it's long after this encounter, right? I think Peter goes back home. They, do what they normally do. They go fishing. They have to make a living, of course. Um, and then, of course, Jesus meets him again. Uh, and then when he performs that miracle of the fish, now Peter, now his eyes are opened. And, of course, that's when Jesus, of course, calls him, calls Andrew, and also James and John at the same time as well. So, Anything else about Peter here? All right, let's take a look at the next story then, because we see Nathaniel. Where was Nathaniel from? Yeah, he was from near Bethsaida, right? Nathaniel uh, is from Cana, which is really close to Bethsaida, and that's where Philip. Um, now, Peter and Andrew, it says that uh, Peter and Andrew were also from Bethsaida. Uh, it's interesting because they spend more time in Capernaum, right? No. Yes. Uh, let me make sure I have that right. Yeah, they spend more time in Capernaum during the Gospels, um, which is 
not that really far from Bethsaida and Cana. Um, Capernaum is right on the Sea of Galilee. Cana and uh, Bethsaida are a little bit off of the Sea of Galilee. You have to walk a little bit to get there. So they're all fairly close together. Um, so they knew about Nazareth, which is, again, it's off of the Sea of Galilee in that area. And so they were well aware of it. But why do you think Nathaniel was so disparaging against it? Because he basically says the same thing that we see the Pharisees saying later on. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? Right. That's, I think that's, that, that hits the nail on the head, right? Nothing, there was n- no prophecy about the Messiah coming from Nazareth. They knew where he was supposed to be born, um, right? But Nazareth, that's, no. That's this backwood, little country, hole-in-the-wall town, village, if that. Like, we have the, we have the saying, like, a one-light one town, right? They probably didn't even have a light. Maybe just a four-way stop sign, right? That's what they had. Um, it was a collection of people. They lived there, but most likely, in order to find work, they had to go outside of that to find uh, to find actual work. Um, so it, it's just kind of interesting that even Nathaniel, that, that there was this um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for reputation that Nazareth had about being this country little town, essentially, is what it was. And even Nathaniel was like, what? No, there's nothing prophesied about that. There's nothing, nothing good going to come out of that, right? What can actually come out of that? So what do, you, how do you, what do you think Nathaniel was thinking through all that whole story then? Absolutely. Uh, and clearly his heart, too, was open to that. Um, but Jesus knew exactly what he needed in that moment. And that's why Jesus said those things, I think, to soften uh, Nathaniel's heart so that he could see who Jesus truly was, for sure. Um, his name is actually fairly uh, interesting. You know, I've mentioned multiple times in the New Testament, there, there's a lot of people with the same name. I mean, how many different Johns did we look at, right? There's always a qualifier to those names. And even when you read the list of disciples or the apostles, it's the same thing, right? You have to have some sort of qualifier. You can't just say James and John. You, you know, you'd be, okay, I think we would know who that is. But in the first century, if you just said James and John, there's probably four or five brothers that you know that have those names. Um, and so they had to say James and John, son of Zebedee. Oh, Okay, yeah, I know who you're talking about, right? So Nathaniel's name is actually not found in the list of apostles, but he, there is another that is always paired up with Philip. So Philip and Nathaniel seem to be very close. And so in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, Philip is always paired with Bartholomew. Now, you may not think, how do you get Nathaniel from Bartholomew? Well, the name Bartholomew, right, that prefix, B-A-R, bar means son of, right? So his name was, they called him son of Tholomew or whatever his father's name was, right? So that was kind of like his surname where his actual name was most likely Nathaniel. So it was Nathaniel Bartholomew is what his, what we would think of as your full name, right? It wasn't exactly the same way back then. It's just an easy way to kind of think about that. Um, they, most scholars believe those two are the same Uh, because they have similar stories. They're always paired with Philip. uh, And even by tradition, after Jesus dies and the church is founded, they, together, they travel up into um, 
up near the Black Sea, uh, where it's kind of modern day Turkey, and preach the gospel there is where they, they go on, they go off together, which is really interesting. They start together and they finish together, unfortunately. All right, let's go ahead and move into chapter two. Whoops. There we go. Wait, that's not where I want to be. Too far. So this is a story that you're probably very familiar with. Um, so you'll notice that uh, back in chapter 1 and verse 43, we find out that Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And that's where he finds Philip and Nathaniel. And of course, that's where he is originally from, is the Galilee area from Nazareth. And on the third day, and that, I don't really think we need to read any, anything when it says the third day. Most likely that's just meaning the third day after he arrived. Uh, there is this wedding. Uh, pretty famous story, one that I think sometimes we're a bit uncomfortable with talking about. But honestly, uh, after studying this story, it truly has come, become one of my favorites in the gospel. And, and I hope that you can take something from it as well. But one of the common questions I think that John had as he aged was, what was Jesus' very first miracle? And so... Here in chapter 2, we pick up that story where Jesus obeys his mother and really saves a couple from social hum humiliation, right? So think about this, that a mother has certain expectations from their children, right? I think all mothers have that. I mean, how much, how much expectation do you think Mary had for Jesus, right? He was a miracle baby announced by angels she knew who he was and who what he was supposed to be right now, we really don't know much about jesus after he was baptized to this point except for these small little stories here right we don't know how active the spirit was right had mary seen more from jesus we really don't know it doesn't seem like it john says this was the first uh, miracle and so that's what i believe that this is the first miracle uh, it seems that besides his baptism, of course, things have been pretty quiet. He's been preaching, he's starting to collect his disciples, and he finds himself in Cana, and now he's been invited to this wedding. Right? And Mary knew that he was special, but here he is at a wedding with family, possibly friends, um, it seems like he knows the bride and groom, maybe. It might be one of those instances where your mother says, you need to come to this wedding because, you know, it's my neighbor's uh, niece's friend or whatever that might be, you know. Uh, he probably had some social pressures there too. And Jesus knew that this would be an opportunity to preach and to, um, and to teach. So really the only thing that we know about Jesus up to this point, of course, is that he was a skilled tradesman, right? By this time, his father has most likely passed away. Um, and of course, he's a wandering pe preacher with a fairly small following at this point, right? But I don't think the people at the wedding really knew what they were truly about to be a part of. They thought this was just an ordinary wedding that was going to take place. Um, but it was going to be much more than that. And I'm sure the couple was very excited. They're about to begin their new life together. They're having this wedding celebration. And of course, right, they can be wonderful and beautiful, but there is so much that goes into the planning and the preparation of weddings, right? And despite months of work, there's still things that are going to go wrong. Uh, I don't often try to give uh, engaged couples uh, advice, but the one piece that I do give is expect something to go wrong and you'll be fine. Just expect it. Because if you don't expect anything to go wrong, then you're going to be disappointed, right? Because <laughs> something's bound to happen. Um, but of course, I'm sure this, this couple did too. There was lots of work and lots of preparation that went into this, right? And what do you think would happen if they ran out of wine? Now remember, these, these feasts can last up to a week, right? What do you think would happen when they run out, if they ran out? I mean, this is like social humiliation, right? I mean, this is, this is equivalent to like 
not having a table for your uncle's family who showed up without RSVPing. He's got eight kids and they want to make sure that he has a steak dinner and his wife is vegan, right? That's essentially what we got going on here is this, this possible drama that might ensue if they run out of wine, right? But Mary seems to be a part of this planning, right? She seems to be, she knows the servants, she knows what they need, she knows. So it's possible that Mary had some sort of hand in actually planning and preparing for this wedding, right? And she knows something is about really bad about to happen, right? And what does she do? She goes to the one person that she knows can help. She doesn't know what that is, but she knows Jesus can help. That's what she knows. And so, of course, she goes to him and says, they have no wine. What do you, what do you want me to do about that, right? And what does she say to him? She doesn't say anything to him. She turns to the servants and says what? Do whatever he says, which is an amazing and prophetic statement, right? She has a problem. She goes to Jesus and says, just do whatever he says, right? I mean, she's speaking in the moment but the spirit is speaking throughout the ages, right? If you have a problem, this is who you go to and follow the words of Mary. Just do whatever he says, which I think it's just... No, I don't think so either. Yes. Yes. And honestly, I don't think she was expecting a miracle either. I truly don't. I don't think that she even, that it would, I mean, I think there was a part of her that knew that he could do something about it because of what she knew about who he was supposed to be. But I don't think she ever expected this to happen. Right? She knew, though, that he could take care of it, whatever that issue was. And I think that's just uh, something that I'm trying to pull out of this is that she had a problem she went to Jesus and trusted that he was going to take care of it for her. You know, so much so that she didn't even answer, right? In typical motherly fashion, no knock on mothers, next next week is Mother's Day, but, right? Okay, son, you you say what you want, but I know you're gonna do something about it. I know you're you're gonna take care of it, right? So, but of course, Jesus, um, and we'll talk about what he replies back with in, in a little bit. But of course, he's a full-grown man, right? He's out of the house at this point. He's the son of God, but he still, in a sense, follows the commandment of honor your mother and father, right? And he also sees an opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Right. So maybe there was more of a social desire that he take care of the social problem. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Right. That's true. That's a really good point. But God never really handles things the way we think he should handle them, right? I mean, and, and I think that's, that's what I love about this story, is that, and even the bride and groom, do you think they had any clue about the miracle that occurred? Doesn't seem like they knew. Doesn't seem like the party guests knew anything about this miracle, right? Because Jesus plainly tells her, it's not, I don't, now's not the time, right? They did this in secret, almost. And it could have been much later they found out Hey, you, 
Do you know what actually happened at your party? Do you know why you had to bring out the best wine at the end? Yeah, because you didn't have any left. And Jesus turned this water into wine. Right? And isn't that how we, we are sometimes? We're going through things, or perhaps there are things that we don't even know about that are on the horizon, but God takes care of those things. And then later on we find out, whoa, that could have been a whole lot worse. Right? Or I'm going through something difficult. And something that I think may or may not work out, but you think something happens. And then when I look back on it, I'm like, oh, that's, that's the hand of God, right? Doing that in my life. I didn't see it in the moment. I didn't know about it. But now when I'm looking back, I can clearly see that. And so that's one thing I've just, I've, I've kind of grown to love about this story is that, yeah, one, you're absolutely right. It doesn't operate in the way that we think he does. Right? We think, oh, he needs to do this. Mm, no, he's, he's going to do this over here instead, right? And which is so much more amazing than getting up in front of everybody and taking care of that in a social way, right? So what does Jesus say? Well, right, he points to these six jars that John tells us are used for rites of purification. And that's why those jars are empty, by the way, because they were used, right? Because there, there was water in them, but if you're going to pour the water out to wash your hands for the rites of purification, well then at some point those jars are going to be empty. And that's exactly what we find. And those actually are uh, some Jewish purification jars. That's what those are. That's not just some random jars. Um, it's kind of hard to see the scale of them, but they would be about, eh, about two and a half feet tall, maybe a foot and a half in diameter or so. So they're not small, right? But I think sometimes when we see, they're like big jugs like this, but they weren't not quite necessarily that large, but they were fairly large uh, and obviously held 20 to 30 gallons. It's a lot of water that they would hold. Um, this other little thing here is actually a, it's a smaller piece, it's handheld, and that's a dipping vessel, which they would actually dip down into the wine and pull that up to taste it is what that little, it was a smaller vessel, obviously, that they would use. So he points to these six empty jars, right? And he says, go fill them up with water. So they fill them up with water, and he says, all right, take a cup to the master of ceremonies. So they would have filled up those uh, six of those. They would have grabbed one of those, dipped the water, taken it to the master of ceremonies. And of course, I'm, we don't really know what's going through the servants' heads at this point. We don't really know like when, the, like, when does the water actually like, change to wine. We don't know all the little details. right? Those are the things that we want to know, but we're not told those things. We just know that this is what happened. <clears throat> right? Uh, and so they take it, and what does the, what does the ceremony, master of ceremonies say? Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is really amazing stuff. You save the best for last. Nobody does that, right? This, this is amazing. Well, th there's a little bit more to that, too, and we're going to talk about that in a minute of, of why, like, of course, if Jesus is going to make wine, of course, it's going to be the best, obviously, right? But there's more to that than just really, really good wine. And it does seem that Jesus really wanted to keep this kind of on the, uh, on the down low, so to speak, right? <clears throat> Outside of a handful of people. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. So there's two possibilities. Either they would have to go to a well or they were at a place where there was a well. Right, exactly. And there, it, well, it would have been work f for sure. Um, now, I would also assume that they were probably in a location where they didn't have to really pass through the party to get, they probably was a back entrance that they would go in and out of. Um, but it does, it, at least it seems to me that this is not a story that, right, and he, it, that's not outside of what Jesus has done, right? He said that to other people as well. Hey. Don't tell anybody about this miracle, knowing, of course, what's going to happen. They're going to go tell people, right? Um, but <clears throat> I, I don't think it was known at that time, 
right? I think it was after the fact when everybody found out, so to speak. So, um, you know, it's interesting because this is really like an acted out parable, right? Because we have these empty pots that were used for the Jewish rites of purification. And then we have, who we find out from chapter one, is the creator of all things who was there. And he takes this water and he creates something new and something better. Right? Because what, what was in, that, in those jars before? Just water. You could wash your hands with those, that water, but I would not suggest that you drink that water, right? <laughs> because oftentimes drinking water from a well like that could lead to bad results. Uh, sickness, bacteria, things like that, right? Which is a lot of the times why they watered it down or watered wine down was to kill whatever was in it. They figured out, oh, we can add some alcohol to it. It'll kill what's ever in there. And then we can drink this water and we'll be fine. Right? So, but think about it this way, right? The Jews used those pots for their ceremonial rites, right? That's what they used it for, to, to wash their hands, so to speak. Then Christ uses that, right? But takes that away and makes something new and better, right? He replaces this old process with something better. And even the master of the ceremonies proclaims that, that this wine is so much better, right? And again, I, he's speaking in the moment, He's speaking for his experience, but it's a very prophetic statement as well in that sense. That the same way that Mary's was, right? Do what he says. This is the best, right? Especially when we kind of put those things together. C.S. Lewis had an interesting way of thinking about this. Obviously, is in his exact words. I kind of paraphrase it a little bit. He says, God creates year to year water to wine, right? It rains on the uh, vineyards. The grapes grow, you take the grapes, you make the wine. So in a sense, God is creating water to wine on a yearly basis. But now here he does it and he just kind of speeds the process up a little bit, right? It's this, the God of the old creation creates something new in an instant, right? He creates from the old and creates something new, something better than what they had. <clears throat> so we kind of talked about a little bit that we can skip through, right, okay. we can skip through those because we already talked about that a little bit so let's talk a little bit about Jesus and his like the relationship with his mother at this point um, his Mary seems to show up twice or not seems to she shows up twice in the gospel once here and then again on the cross uh, where she is witnessing that of course and then there's another time where she is like implied that she might be there, but not uh, specifically mentioned. And of course, it kind of seems like Jesus might be a little rude to his mother, right? Because what does he say to her? Right. And in our language, if, I, if you called someone woman, right, eh, that doesn't come off quite right. But that's not exactly what Jesus was saying. And in fact, it's the same word that he used in John 19, when he's on the cross, woman, behold thy son. It was not it, a better way. We really don't have a word that translates well. Um, Ma'am or madame, or it was actually a word that was used with some um, respect, right? It was not, when we, when we say the word woman, it, was, it wasn't like that at all, right? Because um, as, you, as you notice, Mary doesn't, even though, I mean, you know, we know social things are different back then, but uh, Mary doesn't really respond to the way that Jesus uh, says that to her, right? Because she knows and she trusts he's going to take care of it. And we talked a little bit about that as well. So do whatever he tells you. It's an important thing to remember, for sure. So what do we learn about Jesus uh, in this story? Mm-hmm. 
and he's very much involved in your life too, right? Um, and I think that's another thing that we can learn from this is that he, he wants you to have those times of celebration and he wants to be a part of that with you and he will continue to bless you through that for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. And we're going to continue to see that, right? That he is the creator, that he is creating something new to replace something old. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Yeah. That's a great point, <clears throat> that this was well outside the bounds of their thinking, that this could, one, happen, and two, that's, I, that's not the Messiah that I thought it was going to be, exactly. That's a great point. And we're going to see that again when he feeds the 5,000, for sure. Verse 11, uh, <coughs> this is the beginning of his time to feed the Spirit. Yes. And then the last part of verse 11 says, and his disciples believed. And that's why he's the point there. Believe. Yes, definitely. And it was to affirm the words that he was saying. <coughs> Excuse me. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point and one that I'm sure that we could even bring into our own Christianity of thinking of people are going to sin and we need to be understanding of that and forgiving of that. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, picking up in verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples, d disciples believed him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. <clears throat> um, this is actually the Capernaum site. You can kind of see there's actually a Roman building back here. Um, and over here, you can't really see it, but you can kind of see some stone pieces there. And those were houses 
uh, that were built. And obviously, as you can see, it's right along the shoreline. Um, so obviously a very popular town when it came to fishermen. And I think that's one reason why we see um, both Peter, Andrew, James, and John near this area, at least, because there's a lot of people. I'm sure there was a market. That's where they could sell their fish. And it was on the northern uh, uh, border or northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> and we're going to see this town kind of pop up a lot when Jesus goes to Galilee. And we can even see that through the other synoptic gospels as well, that Jesus is in Capernaum a lot, mainly because I think it was kind of the hub of Galilee. And there's another reason too, is because, <clears throat> but uh, we'll talk about that when we get to um, chapter six, the next Passover, um, because it was a town that visitors often traveled through on their way to Jerusalem. So, um, we are told that he is uh, heading down to Jerusalem for a Passover. Oh, actually, before we get to that. <clears throat> so he stays there for a few days. And again, this is just like speculation. Um, but it does seem at this point is probably when the stories with uh, Peter, James, Andrew, and John happen. I just put all of them in a different order. But that, I think that's kind of when that might story occur. At least it's a, a good time for that story to occur. I don't know exactly when, but it does seem like that this was a little bit of time after he first met Peter, and then this would have been a, a prime time, I think, for him to perform that miracle and then uh, gather some more disciples before heading down to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover. Because <clears throat> like I said, Peter's name doesn't pop up again until later, and so there has to be a point in which we see that there, the time in the story, and that I think this might be that time. But again, that's kind of just speculation, but it, it only seems reasonable that it was a short time after uh, he first met Peter. So, um, What is interesting is that this is the first of three Passovers in the Gospel of John that are mentioned. Um, in the other synoptic, synoptic Gospels, um, only the one Passover is mentioned. But we know he preached for more than that, and so there must have been other Passovers, but John is really the only one to mention the other two Passovers where Jesus goes to Jerusalem, or at least specifically mentions Passover. Um, so they go to Capernaum, and I can mention that it's kind of like the headquarters for his Galilean ministry. We see that come up a lot. And he's also with his mother and brothers and sisters, uh, and, of course, his disciples. I say brothers and sisters because that word that usually is translated as brothers is literally siblings, not brothers. They just put in brothers, but it's possible he had sisters there too. We don't know, but there were siblings with him as well. Which, <clears throat> of course, as you know, their, their minds change a little bit later on about, about his ministry, right? Uh, but then they change back to where they should be, of course. So this, this chapter has this blessing starting off in the, with the wedding at Cana. And now all of a sudden, he gets to Jerusalem, things seem to be going well, and then he goes and he cleanses the temple. So we have this blessing and this curse as well. <clears throat> oh, that is not what I needed to hear at that time. That's okay, though. That's okay. Um, so this is not, obviously, the uh, temple um, now, right? We know that's where the Dome of the Rock is. This is a scale model of what the temple looked like. So, of course, we see this is the area that <clears throat> we're talking about here and all around on either side. Um, over here, like this top section here, and if you can kind of see these little two outcroppings, so to speak, those were stairs that led down. And so all this, the top level here and then downstairs, for lack of a better term, um, is what priests use for storehouses. All along the edges here, here and all along here and on this side and here as well, those would be covered patios, right? It's a covered porch or a portico. There's lots of different words that they use to describe that area, but it was a place of gathering for people and obviously to get a little bit of shade <clears throat> That's why they had these covered, these covered uh, areas. This court, of course, is the court of the Gentiles, where anyone from every nation could come, right? But in the middle was the actual temple, 
right? And we had the, the court here in the middle, and then, of course, the actual sanctuary with the, the holy place and the most holy place as well. Um, and this over here is, will become important later on. That is the Antonia. That is the fortress um, where Jesus was, where part of Jesus' uh, trial happened before he was uh, taken off to be executed, of course. <clears throat> so really, this, it's these outer court areas where Jesus is cleansing the temple, right? And so when they talk about the temple, they do mean all this whole structure, right? Everything that would be a part of that, even though it's not the innermost part of the temple itself, but it's the outer courtyards as well, right? So um, let's go ahead and stop there for this evening so we can pick up the rest of this on Wednesday night. So thank you so much for your attention and comments.